Akron who isn't. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And the screen is on, so I think we're live. All right, so we're going to go ahead and call to order. Um, All right. Um, no, I don't normally ask you, Catherine, but would you lead the Pledge of Allegiance today? I don't think I've ever asked you to do that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Greg, would you be kind enough to do the opening prayer for us today? Thank you. All right, do we have confirmation of quorum? Yes, we do. All right, please make sure you make note that Les is out sick um, and then uh, Sean and Amanda are both absent. I don't have reasons, I'll probably get an email or two, although I think Amanda's got uh, family um, needs that far outweigh email. All right, that moves us to approval of the meeting minutes. I believe everyone has a copy of those from our last meeting. So take a look and um, make any uh, comments you would need to make or motion to accept. Second. <laughs> All right. The meeting. Uh, we have to have an actual vote. Vote to approve the meetings. Let's signal by saying aye. 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 All right. M minutes are approved. It's strange. Normally, I'm. I've gotten used to having more people here. It seems very empty. Okay. Um, According to the bylaws, when the vice chair position is vacant, we have to vote at the next meeting with a quorum. Um, because it's the next meeting we can do business. Um, as you know, uh, Tim was our vice chair and he's been replaced by Amanda Blaylock, but it doesn't go by seat, it goes by person. So we're gonna have to elect the new vice chair. I would like to make a motion to table this until our next meeting. Mm. I don't know if I can. The bylaws are explicitly say that it's required. Hold on a sec. Let me see if I can bring them up. If anyone can beat me, please go ahead. I just thought it'd be better with more of the members here, but whatever you want to do. I don't disagree. I just want to make sure we do everything by the book. Do you have it over there, Greg? The officers shall be elected by the committee from the members of the committee. The committee shall receive. The, the committee shall receive support from any county and school staff as needed to perform the duties of the committee. So as long as it does not disrupt normal county operations and or protocol.
I don't see anything that speaks directly to that. 3.2. I believe 3.2, I think, Jeremiah, you're correct, that the chairman shall preside at all meetings. She, he shall be responsible for direct coordination with the county administrator on all issues affecting the operation of the committee, as well as material issues revealed. Oh, it's above that. Um, vacancies and officer positions shall be filled promptly by a majority vote of the remaining members no later than the next scheduled regular meeting. So that vacancy was as of January 9th, so I withdraw my motion. And I would like to nominate Les as vice chair. All right, Les has been nominated. Any other nominations? I would nominate Greg. Since you're here, do you accept? <laughs> I don't have an issue with that. I just don't think it's right to nominate somebody who's not here. Oh, I think it's, it's great <laughs> payback. <laughs> All right, well, I think um, oh, we'll keep Greg on since we can't ask less directly. Okay, um, I'll second that nomination then. Okay. So, all in favor of Greg becoming the new vice chair, signal by saying aye. 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 Congratulations. <laughs> uh, any votes opposed? Hearing none, congratulations, Greg. You are now the vice chair. All right. That moves us to the next list. Next item on our list, discussion of county maintenance visit. I did send out a uh, my transcribed notes, which I think were like three or four pages long. Um, <clears throat> it's a much smaller facility. It looks like it's a, uh, but they said they have like a million square feet of space that they have to deal with. So um, it's. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, but it's in different buildings. They have some buildings that were that they took over, looks like about 20 years ago, um, that aren't in a completed state. They're like halfway completed internally. The external shells there, the metal buildings, but the internals aren't there. Um, uh, you got pretty much all the the key parts. I did since I've done both uh, maintenance facilities. I did have a couple uh, things that I have as recommendations because I think. They go to the context of what we're supposed to be doing is looking for the, where the efficiencies are. And um, I think, and this is, this is in general mostly because it's something that I think both sides can, uh, both the county and the schools can improve, is establishing, uh, the first one is establishing regular and random inventory audits to confirm the efficiency of your maintenance system and their records. So a lot of these places, they either don't record or don't control some of their supplies or all of them at all, which in business is a big no-no. Um, and there are also places where it's controlled via paper or other systems. Sometimes one person does it, and then that makes it very difficult for anyone else to know whether or not they have it. So while there may be a, a supply of one thing in one department or one section of the department, I don't think the other side even knows it's there. So there could be duplication of effort and other things, which is why you want to have these type of systems. Um, the county has had, they talked about, they were trying to come up with electronic maintenance record keeping for since like 2005, which is kind of crazy to me that you'd be at it for 12 years and not have a solution. So I'm not really sure why that is there. But I, another recommendation I think we should make is establishing electronic maintenance record keeping, work orders, inventory, and other industry standards, and use a single system for both the county and the school. Both the systems used by both are from the same manufacturer, and I think that would go a long ways to making sure everyone's got an even keel, everyone understands, and it also helps incentivize working together, which they're already doing in the vast majority of cases. Are there any tentative costs? Um, with regards to the electronic record, keep, record keeping that 
have, have there been anything drawn up or did you ask that question? Hmm? Well, it appears our live feed has stopped. Well, the red light is on. I thought that was meant to be on. Oh. Um. <clears throat> got type of thing. Oh. Hmm. All right. Um, I don't know what the costs are, but the costs of not having something are fairly substantial. Um, and most of those are hidden costs because you don't see them. You know, it's it's one of those things where your inventory system is not working efficiently. You overbuy some, you overpay something. You don't have. I got a text probably from the same person. Um, the. Uh, uh, we're checking on the live feed, um, <clears throat> which is why a lot of the um, companies and corporations stuff have those, because what happens is you have inefficiencies, you have people ordering things. I don't know what the cost would be, but I'm pretty sure that whatever the cost would be would be probably quickly overcome by the, the savings and efficiencies of being able to look at your system and at the very least track it and see how efficient it is. Um, a lot of the paper systems are known to be notoriously both time consuming and inefficient. Yeah, the only reason I brought that up was because of your statement that the county's been looking at this for several years. So mm -hmm. I didn't know to what degree or extent they had kind of inquired about that. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure either. And some of the people haven't been in, in their positions for a decade. So I'm not even sure if they know when they originally started, why they didn't pick right away. They are using something, I couldn't think it's called facility due. Are you talking about the in automated inventory system or an automated work order system? Both. Or both? The whole thing, uh, you can have, there are systems out there, and they talked about facility due being able to have an automated, and it's, facility due, I think, is made by the same company that makes school due, which is what the school uses. So I'm not, I'm not, coming up with imaginary stuff. This is all kind of like already there. So they have automated work order systems, automated inventory systems, automated uh, ordering systems. All of these things exist, but everyone's doing like a piece and a part. So one person, it seems like they have like the work orders, which keeps track of the parts, but they're not keeping track of the maintenance records of the air compressor or any of the things to know how long it's been since they put it on. So if they normally last three years, they don't have an, you know, something pre-set up to say, hey, you may want to check this. It's ready for its maintenance cycle. They don't have scheduled maintenance on the county side, and they mentioned that directly. I wonder if it's something that they could do a Google um, doc for. Just, you know, set it up so it's real easy to just input the data, and then it goes straight into a Google doc. And um, it, you know... I mean, it shouldn't take much. We use Google Docs all the time. Yeah, and I don't think any. I, I'm not coming up with anything way outside right. of what they already have. And it's and like I said, it sounds like they have like the pieces and the parts, but they haven't gone through and just taken the leap and just say, all right, just put everything in it. Um, and that's that's part of this is that everything needs to be tracked in the system. There are, um, there's like six pallets in the middle of the county one of paper which they use to distribute paper throughout the county for the county offices, just in the middle of the floor. Um, the schools have an entire, mm, about half the size of this room section full of parts, either from old systems or HVAC or whatever. There's no inventories, there's no barcodes, there's nothing. It's paper controlled, if that. And so there's a lot of stuff that's sitting there that they don't know they have. And so it would help them tremendously, I think, for one, not going on to eBay and trying to find an ancient part that they have three of, they just don't know. Or buying pieces of that they either don't have and looking for them or whatever. You know, it's one of those things where there's a lot of time wasted looking for things they don't have or time wasted purchasing things they already have. So it is, is it a matter of they're not putting it into the database they have currently, do you think? It's I mean, a it's a mix of not having a database and not putting it in a database. That is, it, that's that's what I've been able to glean. Is the school just doing that? There was like four different inventory systems. When I did the county, they had the custodial supplies were in a locker room, which 
they order, they put it in there, and then that's pretty much, they take it out as they need to and, I guess, reorder when they see it's low. But they don't know really how many are supposed to be there. So you don't know if someone comes and picks up two bottles and then picks up two bottles the next day. Are they being efficient with the bottles, or did they have a spill and they need to go fix it? And so they don't know. They can't track any of their usage or anything like that. Um, same thing with uh, the vehicles when I made that uh, question related to that. They don't track the fuel consumption of the vehicles. So if you have a truck that's gone from 30 miles to the gallon to 20, they don't know to check it. They don't know that something's wrong with it. That's not being fed back into the system. These feedbacks aren't there, which is where you get a lot of these efficiencies from. So that's why I'm kind of looking at it from context-wise. I think you can probably make some savings simply by implementing some safeguards, some inventory systems, some auditing, just to make sure that you're doing what you think you're doing. Yeah, and I know the schools are going to, you know, they now have their own custodial staff, so... Um, I believe the contractor had been buying the supplies. Is that right, Don? Right. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. But um, basically, now you're going to have to inventory that type of stuff, too. Yeah. Because heaven knows, I don't want to run out of that one ply toilet paper. <laughs> okay, the, the question that, that I have, if I heard you correctly, you stated they, they don't get to do scheduled maintenance, so you're talking about, like, changing the air filters in the building every two months, or that's what I think of as scheduled maintenance? They have... Um some of that already kind of worked into their schedule, but they don't have time apparently to sit and say, okay, I need to go and get, look at this HVAC system. I need to go review this system over here. I need to check the fans over here. All those type of things that you would think of when you think of scheduling, you know, kind of like your car, you know, you need to change the oil, you need to change the wipers, you need to change the windshield wipers every so often, you need to change the windshield wiper fluid and, and those type of things. It sounds like they're getting like the bare essentials to keep things rolling, but not really getting all the stuff done. And part of it is, um, you know, not to use this as a segue necessarily, but one of my requirements is establish metrics on staffing and facilities based on industry standards. How many people do you actually need? How, if you have a million square feet, but you got two guys, I'm pretty sure things aren't getting done. If you have just enough, you're probably not doing any of the preventative maintenance or not as much as you need to to get the most efficiency out of that system. Um, couple that with, you know, not knowing what you have, and you very quickly end up burning through your people faster than you really need to. And I can't put a dollar figure on it without having metrics to say, hey, the last three years you spent this much on it. This year you spent this much on it, and you saved, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 percent. Who knows? But unless you have those metrics, unless you're honest about it, you're not going to have a good answer. Um, I think the county, because they spent so much time on this, and in a sense, I also get the same sense from the school system. A lot of people don't want to pony up for the not too sexy things of maintenance facilities and making sure you have an inventory system and going through the tedious thing of scanning all your inventory and making sure it's right. I think both. Both sides really just need to set a time and just do it by that time. One of the things I noticed was um, the, the county contracts out our HVAC um, uh, work. And are, are you also saying that our contractor does not have or perform regular scheduled maintenance for, for things? Um, the impression I get is that the reason why the HVAC get regular scheduled maintenance is they have a contract to do that. I think um, all told, if I recall what I wrote down, it's like they have like 10 regular full-time people and like seven additional or 10 additional in custodial services, which is really, you know, considering the number of square feet, that's really low. Um, and when you have, uh, they also run things that are printed or need to be printed around the county. So 
the school apparently prints off the business cards. So the school prints off the business cards, the maintenance facility goes, picks them up, and distributes them to the county. Mm, I don't know if that's really good use for them. That's something that's for, for the Board of Supervisors. But when you have that type of time draw, especially with traffic around here, even with a small delay in the area, you can add five, ten minutes. It doesn't sound like much, but do that five, ten minutes over two or three days, over two or three months, over two or three years, you're very quickly adding up to some real, rather large time and when you pay, take them all together. So I think they probably should do that. And something else I found kind of shocking at both facilities for what they have sitting around, none of the facilities have video cameras at all. They rely completely on physical security. So that's probably a risk to the county in the future that you're not gonna realize until it happens. Um, and I think that's something they probably need to do I know it's a cost, but if it helps preserve your equipment and close the loop on things going uh, that you don't intend to, like boards and things that are really hard to trace, um, then it probably should be done. I know it's not monetary, but it, it's one of those things where if your efficiencies lie on the margins, that's where you got to look. You don't know if it's monetary because if we don't have cameras, like I believe there are fuel pumps um, by school maintenance that, you know, deputies use and bus drivers use and county vehicles use and school vehicles use, well, you're going to have to leave that open. So those vehicles can have access to that, but if there are no cameras on it, well, I mean, the same with the county. You know, there are pumps down at uh, one of the other remote fire stations that all of the different types of vehicles use. School buses, you know, deputies use, fire personnel use, county county vans and. Yeah, it, yeah. it could, be, could be monetary. I, I agree with that. I saw you nodding your head, Dawn, too. I agree. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Cameras do. Excuse my teacher voice. Um, yeah, no, I think cameras are a good idea. Yeah, sorry. Um, what about, now, you, you were saying that they were running around delivering things are they delivering things to places they're already going or are they delivering just willy-nilly when a work order comes in for let's just use paper because it's easy to imagine and things like that so let's just say oh, yeah. that, <laughs> let's just say circuit court needs two reams of paper two boxes of paper county maintenance gets the work order mm -hmm. someone takes county maintenance facility vehicle loads up two boxes of paper and drives it over there and delivers it there and comes back. If they need it in firehouse way out by orange, they have to load it up and drive out there and then drive back. And so they have people doing this all day long. Then they have the additional things where, you know, let's say your refrigerator dies and they have to go take care of that. Someone needs to go do that. Um, someone plugs the toilet at the sheriff's department because they don't want to be in jail. Well, they have to go clean that. Um, <laughs> apparently that happens more often than not. So it's, you got these little things that are eating away at their time. So they can't, you can't really schedule maintenance if you're driving around delivering paper and then picking up business cards and driving and dropping off business cards and picking up signs and driving them and pick, dropping them off. So, I mean, you could probably come up with a whole system to improve the delivery system. You know, I was just wondering so. if maybe just hiring one person to deliver things would be the best bet. I probably it'd be my, and I couldn't say what the cost would be, but I'm pretty sure that if you had one or two people like the old mail services that used to run all the time where you had one or two people whose sole job was to run stuff around the County that may end up saving your maintenance facility a lot of time. And you may end up saving a little bit in maintenance costs. I'm not entirely sure. Right. But it's that it's looking at all these details that, and the context of them and going between the two, 
they're all done. They're both done differently, but I see a lot of the same type of approaches to things that could probably get significantly better simply by following some of these recommendations. And that would just reduce the cost of maintenance or at the very least reduce the cost of maintenance in the out years with the equipment that's no longer being worn down so quickly because it's being maintained a little more properly. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense. So I was going to send these recommendations unless anybody has any objections via email. I'll just copy the CBRC on it. Just say this is what this is, you know, after looking at this contextually, I think this is what's really going to give you your bang for your buck. It's not a dollar figure or cut this or cut that. It's looking at the context and say, this is really what you should be doing to reduce your costs. Thoughts, Greg? You're looking very thoughtful. Yeah, I was just thinking about uh, what you were saying in context of the inventory system, the electronic inventory system, and those efficiencies as it relates to people moving around, delivering things, and, and th that could streamline some things. Um, I, I don't know if you can necessarily um, have a workaround that if you don't have a more efficient system in place in, on, the, on the front end. And that's what I was just thinking about. Um, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I just don't know if there's a, a real workaround um, from a daily operational standpoint if there isn't a, a better inventory system to kind of streamline that so that if a person is delivering two reams of paper to the courthouse or wherever, that within that run they're also doing some other things, um, making their time and making the run more efficient. Um, th that's I was just thinking about that. And the question I have, do you think that it would be, um, you know, I'm thinking we should involve J um, Jane Reeve in this because if there is a database um, program to be you know, the software to purchase, et cetera. Because, you know, if you go to Giant Food and you buy um, four cans of corn, that's automatically being deducted from that inventory. And when the right number of ones go, the ordering would be automatic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you have anything like that over at schools or not, or if there's a s system they may have that they like that I um, don't know. But I, I think we need to get, because we're dollars and cents people, and I think this, this would be a great thing for us to put into our, our budget presentation next, or our recommendations next month when we have to make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors at the end of the month on the 2019 budget. Just out of curiosity, when you had mentioned the electronic um, inventory system. Did you mention the electronic inventory system to the main, did you get any impressions or feedback as it relates to how they felt about that? Um, the one, the ones they've been using, the facility do web interface portion of it for the work orders, they love it. It's a web-based, you can put in your work orders, it tracks them, they know who gets assigned, they know how long it takes, they love it. But it's extending it beyond what they're already doing, I think is I think the, the crux is they're so busy getting stuff done that they don't have time to sit and say, you know what, I really just need to take a week and do this because they usually don't have that week. You know, the schools have a, a couple months where they can say, you know what, we're just going to take and repaint this entire school. They have to do all their work on the county side while it's in, in session. Like the judges' quarters lose their air conditioning, that's what they're working on because judges like it cool. Um, but you gotta do that while it's in session. You can't be making noise. At best, you're at night, you know. Times like those where there's not a whole lot of people, so you're not gonna disturb, not disturb a lot of them. And I think, you know, between that and the other duties they have, at least on the county side, they're just so busy that they just can't get past the web-based thing. I'm not really sure how they got a hold of it other than perhaps they had a little bit of time to think about it do the research necessary and do it. Um, but I think county-wise, they might be able to give them some help and get that squared away and say, listen, we're just going to come up with a solution. You guys like this. We're just going to expand it out. 
we'll find out, figure out how to do a little bit extra, get this stuff in inventory so we can track it and know how fast we're going through this stuff. And I think that will help instead of them trying to guess how much they need or when they need to order it, they'll quickly start seeing these metrics and say, hey, you know what, we're going through 85,000 rolls of paper towel in this one area in the court system. Perhaps we need to stop doing that, and then we'll have less toilets to clear. I don't know. But it's that type of being able to say, monetarily, this is what it's saving us because we now see how much we're going through and we can improve things. The county could hire temps to come in and do the inventory and put the th those stickers on everything. I used to be a recruiter for a temp agency, and that would definitely be something you could do. Mm -hmm. um, the schools actually do not have those two months that you think they do. They honestly don't. That's when their scheduled maintenance, when the kids aren't there, is getting done, and things that you know really have to be done in the summer is getting no. completed. Like you know. Yeah, that's but that's kind of my point. It's when they're doing their scheduled maintenance. The county has no scheduled maintenance. They don't have any time where there's not kids there equivalent. There's always people here. I mean, you go into this building eight, five days a week, there's people throughout the building. You really can't just say, you know what, we're just not going to use that side of the building today. Right. So that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is that there's a flow in the school system that has everyone's there and everyone's gone. Everyone's there or most people are gone. So you can kind of work off that a little bit more easily and you have a little bit of a break. They're constantly going, and that's the part that drives you to more, what's the next big thing I need to get done right now? And, the, you know, your days go fast, but you're tired, and you're not really getting anywhere. Right, and which is so, why temps may help them. Yeah, I, I think, and I think that's part of the bigger context, and I want to try and frame it that way in the email. Say so this is a bigger context, and you can do this. It's going to cost a little bit more here, but if that allows you to, instead of using 30 people to cover the million square feet, and you can do it with 15, well, that's only five more you need instead of 20. And it's that type of, you know, instead of working harder, work a little smarter, do a little bit extra now, save yourself in the long run. If it makes, if it makes systems last five years longer, that gives you more time to work on things. Well, also saves you money in the end. Yes. All right, unless there's any other questions, I think we'll go to the, uh, oh, sorry, I have discussion of discussion. Um, the uh, fire rescue and EMS um, that Catherine went to get some uh, information and she had sent out, and there's a copy over there on the uh, fire and rescue allocation consolidated budgets, which she said was more accurate. So would you like to talk about that, Catherine, briefly, or? Actually, I think Bonnie would do a better job explaining it since. All right. Well, if you wouldn't mind helping out Bonnie, uh, use our extra mic over there. This, um, this is a page out of the fiscal year 18 adopted budget, and I have modified it to include the fiscal year 18 adjusted budget on the right-hand column. Um, what it shows, and I'm sorry we don't have it to display for the people watching at home, but um, what this shows is the fire and rescue allocation and the consolidated budget. Um, it shows the allocations that are provided to Chancellor Volunteer Fire and Rescue, Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire, and Spotsylvania Volunteer Rescue. Um, there are a number of accounts on here that are um, Recalculated every year, things like the electric, the heating services, telephone, that really is going to be based on trend and based on what we think the usage and the rates might be coming up. So that's something that Fire and Rescue and or the Budget Office would calculate and um, estimate for the coming year. Then there are things like the allocation, which is the top line for every um, agency here. That tends to stay the same year to year um, for each of these agencies. The intent there, I think really the majority of it is meant for maintenance at the facilities that are owned by these companies. Um, the largest one is Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire where there's 190,000 that's budgeted. That has previously been 130, but the board allocated an additional 60,000 in fiscal year 18 for some paving at company three. Paving and other, other minor maintenance 
minor, major maintenance at Company 3. Um, four for Life and state fire programs, those are um, state dollars that are given to the county based on an allocation and they can only be used for um, either rescue services or fire services, depending upon which program it is. Four for Life is rescue, EMS type equipment. Equipment, Jay? Okay. Equipment and training. And then the state fire programs, that's the same, right? Equipment and training for fire. Um, you'll, note, um, you'll note on the top there for Chancellor Volunteer Fire and Rescue, the, the reason I put in the fiscal year 18 adjusted budget is um, Jay and his staff have taken some time to um, have conversations with the Chancellor Volunteers um, and due to some reduced coverage that's occurring still in the Chancellor area, we have reduced the allocations that go to the Chancellor Volunteer Fire and Rescue Agency because the, um, the career staff is picking up those hours. And so we're reducing the allocation to the volunteers. Which allocation are you referring to? Um, in, that, in that context, I'm referring to the entire budget that's shown here for Chancellor Volunteer Fire. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used the word allocation because there is a specific line item called allocation. Um, but I was talking about the, the entire budget there. Okay. I do have a question on the four for life. And I'm not sure, since you said it's state money, there's adopted budgets are in the seven to $14,000 range, but the adjusted budgets are in the 80 to $90,000 range. Is there a particular reason for that yes, disparity? Yes, there is a particular reason. And it probably shows in the state fire programs as well. Um, like I said, that can only be used for certain equipment or training. Anything that's not used the prior year, the state does not pull it back, we roll it forward. But if in the, if in the year we roll it forward to, they don't have something planned to spend that on, it rolls forward again. So that's why you may see from, from adopt it to adjust it a big increase. Bonnie, does it ever get, I mean, to where, I see like state, uh, Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire, they have $169,000 and it rolled up, well, wait a minute, then this went to 115, 90. So they must have bought something pretty expensive then to go down to 90. Well, I'm the, the agency request in 18 was the 115.5. Okay. And then the adopted budget actually was less than requested at 90,000. And then from the 90,000 that was adopted, once the carryover from the prior year got rolled in, that adjusted budget is now 178. So do we ever say, okay, you haven't spent what you've, you know, your state fire programs is pretty high. We're, we're going to reduce your allocation. This year? I'm gonna have to let Jay talk to that, but I do know that in the past when we have needed something maybe in the in the consolidated budget or in fire and rescue, we have drawn funding from that um, to pay for the equipment. Really those uh, those two lines, uh, the uh, the state fire programs and the how's it listed here, four for life lines. There, there may be a cyclical kind of expense for those things. Uh, there may be equipment that um, they may save up for for a year, basically kind of holding on to those funds until the following year to have enough money to actually purchase it. Um, you figure, especially the four for life uh, money, you figure a, a defibrillator, one of the life packs that we carry on the ambulances is in the neighborhood of about $30,000. Uh, so if they're using those funds to also uh, make sure that they're training their members, there, there's going to be times where they want to buy something this year. There's not enough funds uh, in that, so they will hold off on spending a chunk of that money until it gets to the following year to actually purchase it. Um, other things that have been purchased with those funds on the fire side may include like a brush truck um, where you figure by the time you actually uh, outfit and equip uh, a a pickup truck with all the pumps and everything that would go on it, you're, you're talking in the $100,000 uh, neighborhood. Um, so all the equipment that goes on as well. So some of that is cyclical to where there may be plans to purchase something, um, but because the the allotment or uh, basically coming from the state is not enough to 
purchased in that year, they may hold on to it that year to put it with the funds that would be received the following year to actually purchase at that time. Well, I saw, um, I was looking at, at bill pay and there was one that was charged to that uh, payable to Sheehy Ford. So I had to assume maybe that was a staff vehicle. That would have probably either been a staff vehicle or again, it, it may have been a brush truck. Depends on when that was. Was that this past year? Mm -hmm. That was probably a staff vehicle. Okay, because I mean, I didn't know she Ford could install the pumps and all of that. They, they don't. It's usually just the purchase of the vehicle through them and then uh -huh. we use another vendor to equip it with the pump and, and okay. piping and so forth. While you're out there, Chief. Um, I did notice that the telephone services for Chancellor is 4000 for the FY18 adjusted budget. Spotsylvania Fire Volunteer is 16500 and Spotsylvania Volunteer Rescue is 14000 Is there a particular reason why there's so much variation there? Uh, the number of officers, essentially, that Chancellor has is fewer than the other organizations. So most of those funds go towards... Um, cell phones for uh, some of the officers to use for department business as well as probably air cards for certain computers. Um, so since Chancellor is really responsible only for one station at this point, where Spotsylvania, Spotsylvania Volunteer Rescue Squad covers four stations and Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department covers three stations, there, there's an increased cost there associated with those. Okay. I wasn't sure because it never really called out. I kind of assumed it was a size thing. But. How are you? Um, quick question. If you're holding funds over for a certain piece of equipment, um, are you notifying or, or kind of noting that to anyone to let them know that, you know, we're saving this money and we're going to roll it over to next year for a very specific item? The, the volunteer agencies manage that money themselves. Um, so the, the answer off the top is no. Um, however, Year to year, especially with uh, the pass-through money for what's called the State Fire Programs Fund, every year we have to provide a, a plan. This is actually just enacted last year. We have to provide a plan on what the uh, funds are anticipated to be spent on uh, for projects that are, are forthcoming. So we're, we're fairly fortunate as a county because of the uh, size of the population we, we have we receive more money than other localities would. Um, so for an example, someone may be saving up essentially to purchase a fire truck with those funds. And you're talking about fire trucks these days are in the neighborhood of 800,000 to a million dollars. So if a department is only receiving 100,000, 200,000 dollars a year uh, through that account, then they're going to hold on to that money and say we're saving up for you know three years from now to be able to purchase a piece of equipment. So we had to provide that accounting back to the state before they will release the following year's allocation. Okay. Right. Quick question. The volunteer fire companies, they do, most of this money is um, raised, right, by the volunteers? No, this is separate from fundraising. This raising. is separate? Oh, okay. Right. These are dollars provided uh, through the county. Okay. Okay. It, but they do also raise money yes, they do themselves. Research. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, you referred to um, rolling apparatus as a term you used. So, I mean, would Spotsylvania volunteer fire or Chancellor fire even think about saving up for a, for a fire engine nowadays? I want to say the last time uh, that something like that was done, probably back in 2008, 2009, uh, when Fire Company 10 first opened, uh, Chancellor used uh, some of their funds through a variety of means to actually purchase a, a fire engine uh, for use at that station. Uh, these days, with the amount of uh, the cost of that equipment, it would be very rare for something like that to occur. So that's why we, we tend to budget for those things through the capital improvements plan. Um, but there are, are cases where they would, again, purchase maybe a brush truck, uh, some of the staff vehicles for um, duty chiefs and so forth. 
And one other question. Where does this money, I know that, that you said in our meeting that you um, give quarterly checks on, on the allocation and on the per diem. But where does the rest of this money reside? Does it reside in our treasury and it's drawn on, or does it reside on the books of these agencies? No, the remaining funds. Uh, like the four for life and so, all that. So you can look at the per diems similar to uh, the allocation. So that is a an amount of money that is uh, essentially given to uh, those volunteer agencies to administer. The remaining lines in here are things that uh, the agencies would have to provide invoices for, and they are accounted for the same way that any of the funds coming through the, the county department would. They're paid for with, with POs and, and so forth. But if they wanted to use their allocation and per diem, just for per diem, they would be allowed to because that's their money once that quarterly check is written. Is that correct? That, that would be their prerogative to do so. Okay. Oh, I'm pretty sure we've already drifted into questions for fire and EMS. So does anybody <laughs> have anything else? Not seeing any, I think you're off the hot seat, Chief. Thank you for your uh, you willingness to answer, answer questions on the fly. Um, especially on such detailed objects as what does this line mean mm -hmm. and where does that money go all right this brings us to schedule for the budget season um, the county presentation on their uh, budget is the 13th of February the school presentation is the 15th the next scheduled CBRC is the 26th, and the two weeks from the 13th is the 27th, which is the day after our next CBRC meeting. So I'm just trying to make sure everyone's aware of this, for one. Um, the other thing is I want to make sure that we're good with meeting once before we have the discussion, or do we want to try and have a meeting after the 15th, but before the 26th, perhaps the week in between, to say, okay, where are we at? What do we want to do? How do we want to report on this? And I'm up for discussion because I'm, I could kind of go either way, but I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Well, I think last year we met every week for several weeks going up to the, to the presentation because we have such a quick turnaround time once we're handed the the proposed budget and um, I would say we probably do want to meet twice or unless you can get the um, presentation pushed you know forward to the middle of March or something well, I know we had moved our CBRC for the 19th because that's President's Day um, we could do it later in that week, um, like the 20th, 21st, just to throw some numbers out. I think the 14th is Ash Wednesday, so the 21st we'd start conflicting with Lenten services for people who go to those. Um, so we could meet that week to talk about it, firm up our stuff on the 26th and present on the 27th. It's an ambitious cycle, but it's ambitious to go through two weeks and have an answer. So, and we can also decide to just say, let's just email it around because three of the seven are not here and I don't, I don't want to leave them out of the conversation, but we have to make some decisions sooner rather than later because we have to follow all the protocols for make, setting up meetings and getting everything on the website and everything else. Tuesday and Thursday, but with the 20th and the 20th. Have a meeting on the 23rd. <coughs> I'm good both days as well. Okay. <clears throat> 
affect the availability of the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll help check the availability of the room, among other things. Which I can think I can do at the same time as emailing around everyone, um, just copying Nadira and say, hey, is the room available these two days? And by the way, is everyone else available these two days? And then we'll just pick whichever one seems to work the best for everybody. All right. That fixed that. Do you know about the 22nd? So I think that narrows us down to the 22nd as a possibility. All right, I will send that out later as the option and kind of go from there. Jeremiah, do we know why the school presentation is always after the county? Not Wouldn't it be more efficient to have the school present and then the county? I would think so as well, but the school seems to, as far as I can recollect, has always been behind schedule-wise. They have to have it done before, but it seems like they always do it after. And I, that's something you'd have to ask the school board members. Dr. Meyer? Dr. Meyer, do you... Not to put you on the spot, but he did, he, he's not sure either. So I don't know. That's a good question. Is that something we could possibly suggest that they let the, you know have the schools present first, and then and then the board presents? Oh, here comes Bonnie. Yes, I think Bonnie. Some of it has to do with there are a number of iterations of the school's budget. First, the superintendent has to propose his budget to the school board, and then it's the school board that presents the school budget, the school board's budget to the county board. Um, and it's not until the end of January that the superintendent presents his budget to the school board. The school board needs to then have time to work through that budget um, with the superintendent to come up with what their recommended budget to the supervisors is. So I think it has to do with that timing. And then our budget just has to be out there. And um, I don't have all the particulars right now because I always have to look it up. But in reassessment years, we have certain dates that we have to hit um, for advertisements and such of those reassessments and then coordinate that along with the budget process. So um, that's that's why this schedule is the way it is at this point in time. It just, I, I wonder if it would bring down tensions a bit if maybe, you know. I think in order for that to happen, the superintendent would have to back his budget up until earlier in January or maybe even at some point in December. And that doesn't work because we don't get the governor's budget until right. the middle part of December. And that's the, that's the starting point for the school's budget. <sighs> Too much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. For, I just came from an all-day meeting, so my head is not screw, attached quite late to reflect all the reasons. But Bonnie did hit on the essentials. In order to accomplish what you're asking, Don, specifically, the superintendent would have to know what the governor's proposing. That budget comes out usually mid-December, and that only gives a month or so because of the holidays in there to construct the budget. You know, they have the request, but to put together based on what revenue is coming from the state and uh, to in order to know what would be the potential impact on the locality. So then it's, once that is, pre we have the school board our hands are tied until we receive a budget. Once we receive it, then we have to go through it. So basically, essentially, we've got two to three weeks to digest the budget recommendation and then come up with a decision that we can then recommend because once we assume that budget, it's a school board budget, and then we're recommending it to the Board of Supervisors. It gets presented, and then we have a date set aside for Q&A review and going through any line item questions. So it's, I think we've looked at that, but we're restricted by certain uh, timelines, you know, from other agencies, not just our own. Bureaucratic from higher up. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, trying to uh, receive yeah. good information because we could prepare a budget and the board could have a budget, but is it realistic with the revenue? And when you're dealing with a new biennium, you really don't know what's going to be there until the governor presents. Right. 
I think even if the you know Stafford pre superintendent presented his last week because you know there was an article in the paper, if even it could, well, if you have an idea of what the county share would be, I think in what Dawn is saying, I agree with. You know, it it would relieve some of, of the tension. But maybe if you could even back it up a, a week or two. or And I know they have to have uh, dates of um, advertised tax rates and uh, things like that. And I believe I saw on something um, that this year, the earliest, we can they can pass a budget is April 4th. Is that correct, Bonnie? April 5th. April 5th. Okay, and that's because this is an assessment year, correct? And Dr. Meyer, now when the governor proposes a budget, does he propose it for two years? Biannual budget. Okay, so you kind of figure whatever you got the this, first year, this, you're going to get the second year, or is this the second year of a biennial budget? No, oh, this is a new biennial budget. Mm -hmm. Correct, Phil? It's a new buy-in, so it's a two-year budget. But this was done by, by our outgoing governor, correct? Correct. Correct. Presented by him, and then that, but that's what the General Assembly will be working off of. That's the documentation that they will need, and that's what the school division has to base it on, because that's the only thing that's been confirmed. Right, because the new governor wouldn't have time. Right. So the question, can it be backed up? It's a question of receiving good information. Okay. Dr. Mark, could I ask a question? Sure. This is just a question from my clarification. It kind of goes along with this discussion. Now, you, for uh, clearly for a two-year budget, you would kind of know the two years at once. But have you looked at and you know, looked at the trends, you know, last four or five, six years and say, okay, they're kind of in this area. We're going to start our budget there and put enough of a framework to make it easier to work afterwards? I, I'm once again, I know there's a whole bunch of cogs, wheels, boxes, and everything else needs to be done. I'm just asking, is that how you get started? Or is that, do you have to wait till after you know the exact number? I, as a school board member, I'm not in a position to answer that kind of a question because that's an administrative question that, uh, you know, Dr. Baker and his team work with that. I'm sure they take a look at it, but... Uh, I do know in having developed those in the past, a biennial budget from one biennium to another, there can be some significant changes. And it, it does, your second year of the biennium, yes, that's been pretty well defined, and that you can build your budget a lot easier. But in your first year of the biennium, there are so many unknowns. Just like one of the pieces of information we received today had to deal with a VRS. You know, what's going to be proposed? Well, that's a you know, if you were to go by last year, you'd be way off from what's going to be what's being proposed. So, and it's a significant budget maker. So, I mean, it's just one aspect of it. The other is the health insurance. You know, that's a major driver, and those are pieces that are being worked on. So, Ms. Shelley and I are anxious to receive the budget next Monday, so we'll have <laughs> more concrete answers. But up to now, you know, we're really in a wait mode for ours. No problem. I appreciate you clarifying because I wasn't quite sure how much disparity there was between the two-year budgets. Between bienniums, there can be. Okay. So I'm. Um, I think we're all looking to improve the efficiency and trying to make sure everyone has easiest easiest time through this, especially us because going through both budgets in two weeks is more, is rough. Yes. Um, so I definitely appreciate your answer. Um, on the plus side, it does look like the county and the school presentations are getting closer. I think last year they were two year, two weeks or a week apart, so now they're only two days. So. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> they're moving closer, so at least we're getting uh, closer to that condition. Yeah. Um, maybe next year they'll do it the same day, one and then the other, um, with a very heavy-duty coffee break in between, because I know I would need it. <laughs> So I will send out an email um, looking at the 22nd, see if people can do that to, to sit and go over the budgets and come up with what we want to uh, talk about and then uh, finish it up on the 26th. And that allows us to present on the 27th on time without any additional uh, headaches. 
I've uh, tentatively put it in my calendar, so I don't put anything else there. Okay. Um, I think this brings us to new business. The only thing I can think of with new business would be I find great value in what you're suggesting with the maintenance, and if you could ask Jane to look into that and price that or see what might come up because we have to give it a financial impact. If that is something that the committee decides they vote on, they would like to recommend to the Board of Supervisors and I think most of us sitting here think so, so um, we wouldn't know how to price that. What I might also do is I might try and look online, see if I can get some rough figures of things, of places that have put it in, someone to figure it out, all right, we put in the metrics, and then how much were we able to improve maintenance-wise, because I'm pretty sure this is going to be highly dependent upon where you are, what situation you're in, how big, how, how complex, how many wickets, what time of year, whether or not you're in a recession or a boom, I'm pretty sure it probably is more complicated than we would like to think. But I'll uh, see about um, that because she would probably know the cost of the current system that they're using. And I believe that our meetings are coming out of her budget and can she afford for us to have this extra meeting for the for if it has to be videotaped. Understood, that's a good point. Something to add to my email, hold on a sec. Anything else? Um, on seeing none, I will entertain a motion to close. I make a motion to adjourn. All right, everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Too.